Can you throw something so hard that it goes into space? A question that we have all asked ourselves. Spin Launch, a startup based out of California, says yes. They've built a 50 meter tall suborbital accelerator as a proof of principle test for launching payloads into space. Today, I wanna to talk about the practicalities of their space trebuchet and ask, will it fly? Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Miles and welcome to Spin Up Science, where we look at the intersection of science and startups to see how cutting edge discoveries will impact our world. Spin Launch is heralded as the space industry's best kept secret by Wired Magazine. I want to understand if this is really a game changer for spaceflight, or is it just the media spinning up the old hype machine? I'm going to look at how it compares to the competition that's out there at the moment, and I also want to look at three key technical challenges that the company is going to need to overcome. The problem Spin Launch are trying to solve is that getting to space is difficult and it's pretty expensive. At the moment, we do it by sitting on top of huge liquid rocket engines where, for example, something like the Saturn V, the only launch vehicle to ever get human beings beyond low Earth orbit, about 85% of the mass of that rocket is made up entirely of fuel. Compare that to something like a car, which has a mass fraction of about 4%, and you see how much it really takes to get these things moving. The premise behind Spin Launch is simple, flip the rocket equation on its head and significantly reduce the cost of launch. If they can throw the rocket some distance into the atmosphere, they shouldn't need to have as much fuel on board, and this should cut down on a major per launch cost. Spin Launch's suborbital accelerator is essentially a G-force training machine used to prepare fighter pilots, but it's turned on its side so that it's rotating vertically. An actuator arm spins in these first test launches at about 180 RPM, with a payload secured in a release mechanism at one end of the arm and a counterweight at the other. The whole system's kept under vacuum, and over an hour and a half it spins up until the rocket is ready for release at a point where its tangential vector aligns with the exit port. That's a reasonably narrow window to hit, particularly moving at that sort of rotational speed. 60 seconds into the flight, once the payload reaches about 200,000 feet, a two-stage chemical rocket kicks in and takes advantage of the thinner atmosphere and shorter distance to propel the payload the final bit of the journey into space, requiring overall a fraction of the total fuel needed if it were to be launched from Earth. Now this is just a test facility. Spin Launch are planning to upscale their project with an orbital accelerator, a coastal launch facility taller than the Statue of Liberty, expanding from 33 meter diameter to over 100 meters, achieving 450 RPM, which would generate over 10,000 G of acceleration. That increase in speed would see payloads accelerate to speeds that max out around Mark 7, seven times the speed of sound. Spin Launch's first generation of kinetic delivery payloads are estimated to carry approximately 200 kilograms, which is about 150 small satellites into space in just a single launch. Now this sounds fantastic in principle, Spin Launch obviously are facing a huge number of engineering challenges. I want to talk about three of the big ones in particular and how they're going about trying to solve them. Number one, getting a reliable launch trajectory. To throw the rocket out of the exit port, let's assume the payload tether is traveling about 450 RPM and needs to be released with about one degree of accuracy. The release mechanism has about a window of one third of a millisecond to get this job right. From an electrical timings point of view, that's pretty easy to achieve to send a signal to release mechanism to disengage, but the physical mechanical separation is probably a little bit harder. I found on the internet a few examples of reusable non-explosive actuators for release of killer newton payloads, so I feel like developing something is possible. The problem is, if it ever fails or is slightly mistimed, you end up throwing your payload at about seven times the speed of sound into your launch facility. You can even see what I would consider maybe a minor example of this misalignment in the footage released of launch, which shows some lateral movement in the payload as it emerges from the exit port. A few reports even suggest that the payload was seen tumbling as it left the exit port, which also obviously isn't ideal. But I would also say this is one of the first major tests that they've done, so we shouldn't hold it against them too hard. Spin Launch's aim is smaller launches more often, so these systems will need to be used reasonably frequently. SpaceX has 26 launches this year of significantly heavier payloads, that's about one every couple of weeks, so I'd imagine the goal from Spin Launch will be even more frequent than that. Now, obviously the space industry is no stranger to losing really big expensive assets during launch, but depending on the extent of the damage, losing a facility is probably slower to replace and it's very much harder to build backups to the system in parallel. 
So all that to say, I guess we shouldn't be surprised maybe if some of these early tests in particular don't go that well. Uh, Spin Launch's goal really will be to build a design that allows them to retrofit, repair and replace as quickly as possible. Number two, the next biggest challenge will be the extreme heating that this system undergoes as it ramps up to full speed. Similar to why satellites and meteors burn up in the atmosphere, traveling fast through air causes very high temperatures, partly from friction or air resistance, but mainly because you are creating a shock wave ahead of you if you are going meaningful orders of magnitude faster than the speed of sound. The air simply doesn't have time to get out of the way and becomes superheated and creates a shock wave. This shockwave can reach temperatures of up to 20,000 Kelvin. One of the reasons you see re-entry vehicles with flat-ish kind of bottoms to them is that this creates a boundary layer between the shockwave and the craft, essentially giving it some insulating air gap to reduce the heat buildup and essentially pushes that superheated shockwave slightly further away from the craft. The places where you'd worry about this for spin launch obviously is in the rocket payload that they're accelerating, but equally in the armature that they're using to spin up the system. It looks like they're developing a couple of strategies to solve these problems. They're aiming to operate their mass accelerator in a vacuum, firstly, which means basically if there's less air, there is less air resistance, so you don't get as much heat build up into the system on both the arm or the payload. Creating a vacuum initially really worried me because pumping something down that size to a really low pressure would take hours, if not days at a time, and even a few small pinholes throughout the system would make it basically impossible to achieve. I spent a little bit of time reading through some of their patents. They aren't actually aiming for that good, that good of a vacuum. They're aiming for about 10 to the minus two tor, which is about two to six orders of magnitude less than something like a scanning electron microscope, which uses electrons to take pictures of atomically small things. So what they're aiming to do is difficult, absolutely, but I would say it feels in the realm of feasibility. The other thing that they mentioned you can see throughout a lot of their renders is that they're using a lot of composite materials, which can be engineered to resist thermal heating really well, particularly when it comes to expansion or warping, which you could imagine if you had a really large spinning object slowly getting up to speed, any amount of warping, twisting, or it growing due to thermal expansion could potentially misbalance the whole system and cause things to end badly. They also hint at a couple of other ideas that they might be considering as possible other shielding approaches. Things like ceramic heat shields like you see on the space shuttle, ablative carbon phenolics which you see on things like the Galileo probe, or heat sink tungsten nose caps like you see on things like the X-43A which is a scramjet launched by NASA that achieves speeds of well over 7,000 miles an hour. Regardless of how they tackle it, heat will be one of the major enemies in trying to get this thing in one piece into space. A third problem I see, and I've seen a couple of videos that kind of express it, but not too many that talk to the potential solution for it, is the bearing shock that will be experienced as the payload is released. The final problem happens at that kind of T minus three millisecond point. The payload tether goes from holding a couple of thousand kilograms of mass, the rocket payload at the end of it, to holding nothing. If your system is rotating at 450 RPM, it feels suddenly like letting go of about 500 elephants. This will cause pretty considerable strain both on the armature as well as on the bearing system. Again, spending a little bit of time digging through the patents, though I haven't seen it in any of the renders or the demonstrator unit, Spin Launch intend to tackle this with a counterweight and an opposite exit port that releases an equal and opposite mass at the exact same time to keep the rotor system balanced. Again, though the problem here is essentially you are releasing a projectile traveling at Mark 7 inside your facility. So catching it and catching it gently is going to be important, which I haven't yet seen an answer to how they're proposing to do something like that. Overall, looking beyond these kind of three major technical challenges, Spin Launch is looking to differentiate ultimately by offering lower cost access to space. So it's important to look at how it stacks up compared to the competition. Virgin Orbit is a recent entrant into the space market and offers the Launcher 1 a satellite delivery rocket that is taken high into Earth's atmosphere and delivered into orbit by a customized Boeing 747. The guide price for this service weighs in at around $12 million with a maximum payload of about 450 kilograms, which is expensive, but you're paying for the convenience of using commercial airports to launch this aircraft rather than using space stations. Launcher One ultimately works out about $27,000 per kilogram. 
kind of expensive. SpaceX, which will be the one that most people have heard of, obviously offers the Falcon 9 and access into their ride share program so that multiple customers can share the launch costs for smaller satellite launches. Falcon 9 can lift payloads of up to 22,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit and costs about a million dollars per 200 kilograms or about $6,000 per kilogram. Whilst even the larger orbit accelerator by spin launch will dispatch payloads of far less than half of Launcher 1, spin launch are prioritizing multiple satellite payloads, much greater frequency, fraction of the cost. Spin Launch's projections aim to reduce the cost per launch to about $500,000, working out as little as $2,000 per kilogram. And I've seen a lot of people in comment sections and in videos and things like this really kind of dismissing this as an idea, and I think some healthy skepticism absolutely is the right thing. Uh, but equally, it's worth bearing in mind that really the pain point driving the growth of this sector at the moment is the launch of increasingly small satellites. Things like CubeSats are the most common thing that being launched at the moment in terms of volume, in terms of number, and they only weigh a kilogram each. So if you can fit a few hundred of them onto your payload, then you might have a real valuable proposition if at the end of the day, customers are looking primarily at the bottom line as to which launch service they may actually need to go with. Now, some things I haven't touched on are the fact that you do need to rejig your satellite if you are going to use it in this sort of a system because the g-forces that it's exposed to mean that some of the common kind of parts that are used won't necessarily work. Spin Launch are hoping to solve this by offering kind of an environment and ecosystem suite that means that you can buy some things off the shelf from them that have been engineered to withstand these higher g-forces. All in all, that to say, Spin Launch is a really interesting company. It's doing something that very few others are trying to do. So for now, at least chemical rockets will have to do the majority of the heavy lifting, at least in the near term. But considering the direction that the marketplace is moving in, I think if they can get the technology working, Spin Launch absolutely have the possibility to carve out a really interesting value proposition for themselves. And at the end of the day, their goal is democratizing access to space which I think is a goal that all of us can get behind. If you like this video, you might wanna check out this video here, where we talk about four ways to capture space debris that is orbiting around us and trapping us on this spaceship called Earth. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.